Hi everybody. This is um, either this is the best time slot because it's at the end of the day and you can all kind of sigh and have a bit of relief, or it's the worst time slot because you're all pissed drunk. So, as you heard, I'm an architect, right? I'm not a contractor. I build stuff, and um, I do all this other stuff that is an architecture. I give talks and I write books and I write articles and teach and all this other stuff and I realized a long time ago, now 10 years or so, that uh, the reason for that is because we need to make every building a green building, not just the ones I design, but every building. So now I work towards that in other ways. But I'm not here to talk about me or my best-selling book, which you should all buy, <laughs> which comes in a convenient pocket size, which is perfect for Christmas. I'm not here to talk about the two other books that just came out this week that you should all purchase. <laughs> so I was here a year ago, exactly a year ago almost, and um, gave a talk to you about, we talked about the suburbs, for those of you that were here, if you remember. We talked about Las Vegas. Well, we're not going to talk about that today. What I'm going to talk to you about is really what's kind of become clear to me in this last year. Now, the poet, uh, writer, Ralph Waldo Emerson, when he'd see friends he hadn't seen in a while, he would say to them, what's become clear to you? And I always liked that. I always thought that was kind of smart. So that's what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you what's become clear to me just in this past year. It's become clear to me that if you pee in the shower, well, you're a hippie. But if you, <laughs> but if you tell people that you do it in order to save on the water, well, then you're a greenwasher. <laughs> and that's the way that works. Speaking of greenwashing, it's achieved a whole new level that I don't understand anymore. Now, I, I've stared at this for hours. And I don't, I don't know what's green about it. Maybe her breasts are recyclable, I'm not sure. But merely putting, throwing the word around is apparently enough now it's become clear to me that we had more wind turbines in 1920 than we do today. And that we must be doing something wrong because we're going backwards. And that programs like the Royal Electrification Administration that really centralized our power, although they had a good intention, maybe it was the wrong one. It's become clear to me that there are jobs that are no longer jobs that are no longer allowed to become extinct. There used to be. We don't have lamp lighters anymore. We don't have elevator operators anymore. They were replaced by technology. We didn't need them. But nowadays, we're no longer allowed to do that. So coal miner, for instance, is a job that's no longer allowed to become extinct. Uh, oil company executive, it's a job that's no longer allowed to become extinct. And maybe we should think of these terms as their inevitable exit strategy. It's become clear to me that we don't have any economies of scale in building. I mean, we think we do, but we don't really. Even if we're building 1,200 homes, we're still building each one at a time. And just because we're staggering the work crews doesn't mean that we have any real economy of scale. I mean, after all, we're not building these things like Tetris, right? We're not stacking them together as we should. We're certainly nowhere near real dream of kind of rolling them out like an assembly line where robots are building our homes, even though there are people that are working on it. It's become clear to me <laughs> that we don't have any culture anymore. When I was 21 years old, I spent a year in Rome, Italy, and I studied architecture there, and it was a magical thing. It transformed how I view the world, and, and I remember having my first cappuccino ever. And now, I can get one at McDonald's. And that just is a little sad. It's become clear to me that what we should do is put everybody's utility meters on the street so they can get the scrutiny of all the neighbors. And when you go out to walk your dog, the neighbors can scold you and wag their finger for all the power you're consuming. <laughs> it's become clear to me that we lose nine square miles of polar ice every day. And yet, 
I still have people all the time that say things to me like, oh, you believe all that global warming crap? All the time. And it's getting worse. Of course I believe that there's a climate crisis. Why? Because, you know, I have ears and eyes and a brain and I can read the data for myself and I suggest you all do the same. The question is no longer when it's going to happen or if it's going to happen, it's how severe is it going to be. It's become clear to me that we've forgotten the function of certain things. Gosh, the sun is in my eyes. If only, if only I had a way to shade my eyes in some way. I don't know how to do it. And this is what we're doing with our buildings. If you put south-facing glass on a building, of course it's going to heat up. That's what the sun does. And maybe we should think about it the way this guy should think about it. It's become clear to me that if you start to label things the right way, that it affects people's behavior and affects it for the better. And doing this is smart. And if you don't do it, it's dumb. Speaking of dumb, Paris Hilton built a doghouse for her six dogs, and she spent $325,000 on this doghouse. And this is no ordinary doghouse, mind you. It's got crystal chandeliers, it's wired for power, um, you know, the works. It's air conditioned. It's for her six dogs, let me get their names right, Tinkerbell, Marilyn Monroe, Prince Baby Bear, Harajuku, Dolce, and Prada. I was talking about this with, with my friend Cameron Sinclair, who runs a nonprofit called Architecture for Humanity. He, he goes out in the world and he helps people in need with architecture. And he was saying, do you realize that for $325,000, I could build 22 hospitals in Burma? And that to me just seems a little sad. It's become clear to me that just because something's on television doesn't make it true. And that maybe we should remember that our job as viewers is to question things that we hear. It's become clear to me that we got way too much time on our hands. <laughs> the average Facebook user uses Facebook five hours a month. That's on average. Now I'm guilty of it too. <laughs> Who doesn't like to go on and see how fat everybody from high school got? I get it. But imagine. 350 billion registered users, five hours a month. Did I say something funny? 350 billion registered users at five hours a month, billions upon billions of hours. Imagine if I just took a fraction of your Facebook time, just a few minutes a day of your precious Facebook time and directed it towards making the world a better place, directed it towards making the world good. Imagine the kind of things that we could do. Imagine how many goddamn friend requests you get then. It's become clear to me that there's power in numbers. And just a few weeks ago, we had the second annual Earth Hour, where we asked people around the world to turn off their lights just for an hour. And the best part is, is that they did. 4,100 cities in 87 countries, seven continents, turned off their lights for one hour to so show support for the environment, to ease a little bit of the pressure on our poor planet. And it wasn't just in these faraway places. Even in Las Vegas, they turned off their lights. Imagine that. A billion people, a sixth of the planet, got involved in Earth Hour. So little things add up to a lot. It's become clear to me that we're tired of being afraid. After all, for the last nine years now, we've been told that we're all going to die in a terrorist attack. And that statistically speaking, we're all doomed. But if you actually look at the numbers, there's only a 1 in 88,000 chance of us, God forbid, dying in a terrorist attack. But there's a 1 in 9,700 chance of you choking to death on your own vomit. So what are we really afraid of here? <laughs> there's a 1 in 11,000 chance of you being killed by a police officer. You're eight times more likely to be killed by a cop than a terrorist. Imagine that. So what are we really afraid of here? Maybe we need to realign our priorities. And sadly, there's a one-in-one one chance that you're going to be affected by global warming. 
Again, the question is not if, it's how much. And that's where we are right now. It's become clear to me that if we have netbooks, little computers that don't do everything, but they've got enough functions to handle 80% of your daily needs, if we've got flip cams that don't do everything, but they do enough for 80% of your videotaping, if we have Kindles which don't do everything, but handle 80% of your book reading needs, maybe we could apply that same logic to buildings. And they're already doing it. Markets like Fresh and Easy having automated checkout. It's not for everybody, but it can handle 80% of what you need. Kaiser's doing the same thing with these things called microclinics. It doesn't treat everything, but 80% of what they see gets treated this way. And in doing so, we can right-size the buildings and not have to make them big to meet 100% of all of our needs. It's become clear to me that we're still missing out on all the low-hanging fruit. Last July, McKinsey and Company did this report, and they found that we could reduce our energy use by 23% just through conservation methods, and in doing so, save $1.2 trillion. And we're just missing it. We're just letting it go by. It's become clear to me that the television should be a two-way medium. It's mostly been a one-way, and that's fine, but really, imagine if the TV lived up to its potential. Instead of just giving us reality television, imagine if we could use it as a communication device. Imagine if you were in your hotel room and then you call up on the screen and you're looking, oh, there's pay-per-view and I can check out my bill and all these other things. Imagine if there was this little extra button, eco-performance. Imagine if you clicked on that and in doing so, you could start to look at how your stay as a guest compared to other guests, how your water use, energy use started to compare with other people, other people on the same floor, other people in the same suite other people on the same side of the building, whatever. And in looking at this eco-performance, you could start to change behavior. You could decide if you want the morning newspaper or not. You can set a little timer in your shower to blink the lights when you've been in there for five minutes. Imagine the types of potential we can do with our existing technology. Doing this, we automatically see a 20% improvement right off the bat in performance just by measuring this. There's an old saying, if it gets measured, it gets managed. So let's start measuring things that are measurable. It's become clear to me that there's still a whole new wave of technologies that we haven't even addressed yet. Technologies like augmented reality. That through some sort of looking glass, you could start to filter reality and add data and information to start to change your behavior. These don't exist yet, but there are a lot of people working on it. So imagine if you look through your iPhone, or better yet, your iPad, and you're able to see different things about your building and start to change its performance. It's become clear to me that if Chinese dog food contains melamine, and Chinese baby food causes kidney stones, and Chinese drywall smells like sulfur and corrodes your pipes, and Chinese buildings fall down because they forgot to put foundations under them, <laughs> that maybe there's an overall question of Chinese goods in general, and maybe we shouldn't just buy something because it's cheap. And maybe there's a reason that it's so cheap. And maybe we should keep our manufacturing and processing here where it belongs. Maybe made in China are the three most dangerous words we could ever hear. And maybe we need to change our behavior. It's become clear to me that when Mies van der Rohe famously said in 1946, less is more, and then Frank Lloyd Wright as a smart aleck said, less is less. And then Robert Venturi famously said, less is a bore. That maybe we need a new dictum for the 21st century one that involves sustainability. Maybe what we should realize is that not green buildings cost more, green buildings are more. After all, a green building is energy efficient. It saves energy, in some cases produces energy. It saves water, potentially clean water. And maybe our new dictum should be green is more. And that's what we should be thinking. After all, how does it make sense when we live in a world that has signs like this? This was on a school. And it's not like the kids had a choice not to go in. The sign doesn't have any action, call to action, like, by the way, stop breathing and hold your breath when you're in the, you know, it doesn't say any of that, it just warns you. And that's kind of the problem. And lastly, it's become clear to me that if you're feeling a little lost, you're not alone. I receive literally hundreds of emails and phone calls. Some people show up on my doorstep 
telling me, I want to get involved. I want to get part of this movement. I want to do something that makes the world a better place. Tell me what I need to study. What do I need to learn? What do I need to read? What do I need to do? What certifications do I need? And I tell them all the same thing. Go, start. We can't wait till you're perfect. We can't wait till you feel like you're ready. We need you now. Start now. Pick a problem and do it now. That's what we need. And that's how we're going to make change. So with that, I want to talk to you about what I've been working on for the last year. What I call Detroit, Dallas, and despotism. Uh, and I'm going to start with Detroit. Now, Detroit didn't start out this way. It used to be a cool place. It used to be a grand city, with beautiful tree-lined boulevards. And before it became the punchline to a bad joke, Detroit was really a miraculous city. In fact, it came to embolize the American potential, the American dream. They used to call it the City of Elms because of all the beautiful trees. So imagine Detroit in its grand heyday, mid-20th century. Now, of course, the growth of Detroit is paralleled completely with the growth of the automobile. The two go hand in hand, and the explosion of the automobile parallels the explosion of the growth of Detroit. And by 1950, Detroit was the fourth most important city in the United States, if you can imagine that. And its population boomed. Nearly two million people in the 1950s. And with it came all the other benefits of having a booming, thriving, bustling metropolis, right? Things like Motown grew out of this excitement, all this atmosphere. And Detroit really became the American dream city in a certain sense. If you had an idea, if you had a notion, if you had an invention, a better mousetrap, that somehow you could change the world. And they did. But this dazzling symbol of the American greatness has diminished over the years. Firms and factories started to close. They moved out to other places slowly, quietly, inexorably. The downtown just kind of fell apart. And then it was fueled further by racial tensions. This is the 12th Street riots in 1967. Oh, that is the worst ringtone ever. <laughs> racial tensions in 1967 fueled this even further. Governor George Romney, who Mitt, was Mitt's dad, if you remember, he was governor of, of the state at the time, he made the mistake of ordering the National Guard in, some of you are old enough to remember this, that left 43 dead, hundreds injured, thousands of people arrested. And this furthered this kind of white flight out of the city. And what you have left is this kind of downtown, that the car industry, once the car industry leaves it, Detroit will be able to get on its own feet. And I think that's, oddly enough, what's happening. Because the car industry hasn't really done much since the 1950s, right? It's kind of been in a downhill. Remember the gremlin was going to somehow save? Really? It also didn't help that it, through the 80s and 90s, GM, Ford, they didn't really build cars that anybody wanted. It also doesn't help when the best-selling car of the year last year was this one. <laughs> this is the uh, Little Tykes Cozy Coupe. It outsold the Toyota Camry at just 436,000 cars with 457. And the best part about this car is that it's zero emissions. <laughs> so what we have left is the city of Detroit, the ruins of the city of Detroit, a splendid array of decaying monuments sim similar to the pyramids of Egypt or the Acropolis of Rome, uh, um, you know, gorgeous buildings that are just left to rot. And then, of course, all the social problems that come with it. Unemployment hovers around 29-30%, the highest in the nation. And then, of course, the median home price has plummeted. The average price for a house in Detroit is $5,700. It peaked in 2003, like the rest of the country, and then pff, keeps dropping. Now, to give you a sense of scale, you could buy 100 houses in Detroit for the cost of one here in L.A. Who feels sick right now? <laughs> Let me take you on a walk down a typical Detroit street. Now the buildings are dilapidated, they're, some of them are burnt out, they're abandoned, but imagine that infrastructure rebuilt. Imagine how cute it would be if people lived here and children played here and trees came back and the buildings came back. You can get a sense of what it was like, a little bit of a sense of it anyway. Hopefully it doesn't get you seasick either. And of course, it goes without saying that because of this dilapidation that 
Detroit is regularly the murder capital of the US. This is, by the way, this isn't a painting, that's a photograph. And then all these other social problems that come with it. Detroit has about a 50% literacy rate. High school freshmen have about a 22% chance of even getting all the way through and graduating. So it, the propositions are pretty bleak there. It also doesn't help when you have uh, city councils and city leaders that are corrupt. Uh, Kwame is referring to Kwame Kilpatrick, the uh, former mayor of Detroit, who was indicted on, uh, pleaded, pled guilty to two counts of obstructing justice and he had an affair and all this other mess. So what we have is we have Detroit, this big giant hulk of a city that's now vacant. And it's big. I mean, not only did it house two million people, it housed them in this big area. To give you a sense of scale, you could fit San Francisco, Boston, and Manhattan within the boundaries of Detroit and still have square footage, square miles left over. It's a big place. The sad part is that 100,000 plus lots are vacant. A third, of, a third of all of Detroit is just abandoned. These are real photos from Detroit. It's just empty land. Buildings that burn down and they become structural you know, uh, issues and then they have to take them down. So what you could do is you could take this hulking mass of Detroit and you could fit everybody into an area the size of San Francisco and leave the remaining two thirds as vacant land if you wanted to. But then the question arises, what are you going to do with all that vacant land? And the populations are about the same, right? Uh, 900,000 in Detroit, 800,000 in San Francisco. So you can imagine that. It's possible. And this isn't just my idea. The AIA came up with their own plan of Detroit. And their idea was, let's make these nine little urban villages. We'll keep the downtown core. And we'll turn all the rest of the land into parks, which is really interesting because it's already happening. <laughs> Nature is reclaiming Detroit. It's consuming Detroit. Nature's doing what nature does best. Without man to fight entropy all the time, nature is reclaiming it. These are feral buildings, if you can imagine such a thing. And yet, at the same time, the city council is trying to do things like court Walmart, that somehow Walmart is going to be the magic savior of the city. Well, Walmart doesn't want to go there. Why would they? And yet, with $51 billion funneled to the auto industry to save them, there is no bailout of the city of Detroit. Not a single dollar of that $51 billion went to the city of Detroit. The idea is that it would somehow trickle down. And Thomas Friedman in the New York Times said that this bailout of Detroit, this is going to be remembered as the equivalent of pouring billions into improving typewriters on the eve of the birth of the internet. We're missing an opportunity here. We could retool all those factories, all those plants to build things like, I don't know, wind turbines, solar panels, and reclaim an industry for the United States. The head of the law school there said, the plans are not focused on building a first class city with a smaller population, but somehow rebuilding the city to its former size. Imagine somehow getting Detroit back to two million people, as if that's gonna happen. It just doesn't make sense. So what then would a post-industrial Detroit look like? We can look at near, nearby Youngstown, Ohio as an example. Youngstown, Ohio took 30% of its vacant land using eminent domain and a whole bunch of other tricks and converted it into parks. And they're doing really radical things there. Another industrial city. Maybe we could do the same thing in Detroit. We only really need 50 square miles to house the current population. So what do we do with the remaining 89 square miles? Well, my thought is we should turn it all into farms. And believe me, this is weird. I know it's weird to hear. It's weird for me to say, because after all, I'm an architect. I like to build stuff. I don't want farms. I don't like being dirty or getting in the dirt. <laughs> I like buildings. But this is what we should do with Detroit. We should turn it into farms. Why? Because Detroit needs them. Detroit is what we call a food desert. This is a term I hadn't heard before. Food desert essentially describes a place where there are no longer any produce carrying grocery stores. 80% of all the residents of Detroit have to buy all of their groceries, all of their food from 7-Elevens, the liquor stores. Imagine if you had to buy all of your groceries from a convenience store. Imagine how that would affect your selection. Imagine how it would affect your health. And certainly imagine how it would affect your pocketbook. That's the trouble. All of the grocery stores have left. They've all moved on. Why would they want to stay in crime ridden Detroit, right? So let's reinvent Detroit from the motor city to the urban farm city. The best part is, it's already happening. In the wake of assembly lines, hundreds and hundreds of tiny little urban farms are taking root. And if you're wondering where they're going to go, where they're going to fit, I'm going to show you. Here's Detroit in 1949, 
St. Cyril's was this gorgeous old Art Deco church that since vanished. Here it is in 2003, and here's the most recent satellite in 2008. You want to see it again? 1949, 2003, 2008. Detroit is unraveling. The urban fabric is eroding. It's going away. It's literally devolving right before our very eyes. This is why we have so much room for farms. John Hans, who's one of the biggest businessmen there, a big millionaire guy, he started Hans Farms, which is now the single largest property owner in the city of Detroit. And they're planting farms and creating jobs and creating food. And it turns out urban farms are a good choice for a post-industrial city because urban farming creates $5 a job growth for every dollar that you spend on food. So it's quite a little business. And right now, out of necessity, 15% of all the food in Detroit is grown locally on these little mini urban farms. About 500 of these 20 by 20 lots. Uh, there's a handful of three acre and even 10 acre farms because there's enough room for it. And they're doing all this, remind you, in a four month growing season. Because they, you know, they have winters there. I know you're not used to that, but they have winters there. <laughs> 15% of all their food just inside the city limits, more so than anywhere else in the country. So imagine this vision of combining architecture and building and sustainability into a vision of an urban farm. Tomatoes growing on vacant lots, orchards growing on former school grounds, mushrooms growing in little dank basements, hydroponics in bankrupt department stores, and livestock grazing on former golf courses. A vision of an urban farm. And then we could take these old buildings and using pretty simple crude technology, we could just cover them up and make little greenhouses and convert a four-month growing season into a 12-month growing season. And we already know how to do that. If we use the right plants, we could even detoxify the soil using what's called phytoremediation, plants that absorb toxins and make them just within less than half a generation able to grow food again. This was a little house that um, this little husband and wife team, Gina and Mitch, bought, an uh, architect and artist couple. And they bought this house here for $1,900. Needless to say, they paid cash. <laughs> when they took possession of the house, it turned out people had already come in and stripped out all the copper pipes and all the appliances and all the plumbing. And in a very positive way, Gina and Mitch said, well, this is good because it saved us money on demolition. Now it made it easier for them to add things like solar hot water heaters because the pipes are all out and exposed, right? They now since bought the house next door, they fixed that one up and they rented it out. And now there's this growing movement of these kind of artists, bohemian types, moving to Detroit, buying up cheap property and converting it into green buildings. And we call this phenomenon Rust Belt Chic. <laughs> Think of it, it is the ultimate blank canvas, an entire city with nothing but free space. You could go there and create anything you want. You could go there and buy a whole block if you wanted to and create a sustainable dream. So who's with me? Who wants to get in the bus and go to Detroit? <laughs> the motto of the city of Detroit, it was coined back in 1827 after this big fire they had, but it applies now more so than ever. We hope for better things and it shall arise from the ashes. And I think that's true now more than ever. I'm going to leave you with just a bunch of organizations. I'm not affiliated with any of these. They're just, I'm just fans of theirs, really. Uh, this is the Detroit Unreal Estate Agency that helps outsiders go in and buy real estate because the prices are so unreal. The uh, Detroit Agriculture Network shows uh, tours and has uh, classes teaching people how to grow their own food. Urban Farming uh, takes all their food that they grow and give it away free to the poor, which is kind of nice. The Georgia Street Community Collective uh, they have this mentoring program for kids so they can kind of get in the soil and, and learn something. Green for All is starting a green collar jobs program there. But perhaps the most interesting reason why we should all pack up and move to Detroit, beyond everything else I said, is because when they asked Mensa, you know, the High IQ Genius Society, when they said to them, hey, where are you going to have your conference this year? They said, well, we're going to have it in Detroit, of course. So if those eggheads can do it, maybe we should too. If you want to get involved, if you want to volunteer some of your brilliance and some of your time, here are two organizations that I suggest. And again, I'm not affiliated with any of these. I just think they're great. One is called Arise Detroit, and I think the name kind of says it all. And then, of course, the Habitat there, Habitat for Humanity, would be a good start. Okay. What about our second D of Dallas? Now, I know what you're thinking. 
and they don't like when you make this comparison. And for you perverts out there, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> but in reality, Dallas has a lot of parallels to Detroit because both are cities born out of a new technology. And the age of Dallas is not that old. It's really incorporated in 1856. And you can't talk about Dallas without really talking about oil, let's face it, right? And as oil ballooned up, so too did the city of Dallas. But it didn't explode the way cars did and had a little more gradual climb. But oil helped Dallas weather the depression better than anywhere else. And Dallas quickly became the financial center of the oil industry. And then as oil was starting to lag in the 1970s, a second wave of technology came through. Companies like Texas Instruments, America Cosmetics, headquartered there, that bullied Dallas again through this kind of second wave. And then Dallas has been shaped by other things, both good and bad, that shape it as a culture and as a place that exists in your head. So too is Dallas a donut city, empty downtown, especially at night, and everybody goes out to the rich white suburbs. Definitely not a bagel city there, definitely very much a donut city. And uh, if you compare the growth of Dallas with the growth of Detroit, you could see that da Detroit was explosive and Dallas was much more kind of measured. And this growth is continuing. 1.3 or so million today, and by 2035, 1.5 million, they estimate, in Dallas, and this, it's just going to keep going. And because of all these factors measured in, Dallas has kind of weathered the storms better than the rest of the country. Their unemployment rate is 7 8 percent, depending on the week, which is well below the national average. And Dallas is everything you can imagine. If you haven't been there, it's just pretty much what you'd expect, to, you know, with kind of weird signs and weird food and weird people and you know, and they're real nice, and they look you in the eye and shake your hand and all that creepy stuff. And then they wear hats, you know, which I'm not used to. And um, these, are all, these aren't models. These are all real people. Uh, so just by population, it's became the number one fastest growing metropolitan area in the nation. So it's because of this that we kind of focused on Dallas for my nonprofit, Urban Revision, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Urban Revision started in 2007, 6 or 7 or so with the idea that we were going to help cities develop sustainable city blocks, and we didn't quite know how we were going to do that, but we started with that kind of grandiose idea. And we were going to do this by kind of rethinking and re-questioning things. And instead of the old development model where we say, please, Mr. Developer, please come in and, and please build whatever you want, and we'll bend over backwards and do whatever you say just so you build here, we thought, well, that's kind of silly. What we're going to do is we're going to have the city decide what they need. and. Um, and really let them determine it. And then we're going to approach developers with a pre-finished package. And the reason we focused on cities so much is because for the first time in history, half of the global population now live in urban centers. This has never happened before. And I don't know if you realize how monumentous this is. For the first time in history, a, a, a majority of Earthlings live in cities. So we've really crossed the tipping point from being this nomadic culture that just kind of wanders around to being centralized. And this urbanization of the planet just is going to keep continuing. By 2050, 70% of us will live in urban centers. So with that kind of as a backdrop, we started Urban Revision. And we teamed together a bunch of really smart people. We called them our revisionaries. And then there were several that stood out and really helped shape what we were going to do. And I'm sure you recognize a lot of their names. Um, I don't know if any of them are in here. But it also helped that suburbia itself is a bit of a failed experiment, right? And we've been calling for the end of suburbia for quite, I know I have, for quite some time. So then getting back to Dallas, we thought, what a perfect place to start our first project. After all, it wasn't, you know, kind of in hippie California, where we could just be dismissed as, oh, no, they always do weird, weird stuff there. And it's not in New York, where, uh, you know, all those crazy people there. It was in Dallas, kind of the heartland. So I went to City Hall, and I met with the mayor, Tom Leppert. And uh, Tom's a cool guy. He's a little too tall, but he's a cool guy. And he was, in, um, he was in development for 30 years. He worked for Turner. So he knew what I was talking about. So I said, give me a city block that um, is kind of like the missing tooth on the smile. You know, just a block that you drive by and cringe and think, if only somebody would come along and develop this stupid block, it would really just change everything in this neighborhood. And he said, oh, I've got lots of those. So we started mapping out, I think, 11 different sites that we had looked at. And then finally, we picked one. And conveniently, it was the one across the street from City Hall. <laughs> so uh, there's City Hall right there. Right next door is the Convention Center, which is one of the busiest in the country. And then to immediate north is uh, the downtown, which during the day is kind of busy, you know, because people work there, but then they all flee. And then below that is this kind of nice little neighborhood and lots of other little neighborhoods around it. Uh, but cutting them off is this sunken freeway. Sound familiar? 
And this freeway becomes an impenetrable edge, a wall that prevents anybody from walking anywhere. Um, so with that in mind, we said, well, this is our site. So there's our site. And then we started mapping it out. Well, there's other opportunities here. So if we develop something here, then other people come along and develop it. And two, we applied this thing called the Urban Revision Framework. It's really this blueprint for how to design a sustainable city block. And the blueprint just doesn't look at buildings. I mean, it looks at kind of a holistic picture of how these things all work together. So from job creation to sustainable communities and so forth. And I'm going very quickly on it, but um, that's because uh, I've got a lot to cover. And we teamed up with a lot of smart people and got them involved and roped them into helping create this framework. And then we had a final framework session where we locked everybody in a room for two days and we asked them questions that, well, they hadn't been asked in a long time. Questions like, how do you define community? You know, you use this word all the time, but what does it really mean? And we really started mapping out and defining all of our terms. And in doing that, we crafted this kind of final version of the framework. And then this is what we applied to the city block in Dallas. One of the many things we got out of the framework was this list of how might we questions. So how might we create a place that people would actually want to live in? How might we discourage use of the car? Not, you know, uh, aggressive, just kind of how might we try these things? And from this, it fostered thousands and thousands of ideas. We took all these questions to Dallas and then asked the city to help us put together this guest list of smart people that were kind of shareholders, stakeholders, agency department heads, decision makers, and we locked them in a room for two days, and we looked at our site. And what was interesting was that the guy from city planning said, well, I'd let you do that, but you know, DPW won't, and he points over just nowhere, and the DPW guy's right there. And he's like, hey, man, I'm standing right here. I'd let you do that. And then so, somebody else would say, planning would say, well, I'd let you do it, but the mayor's office won't. Well, the mayor's office is right there. And they're like, yeah, we would. So I started coining a new term to describe this phenomenon, and I, I call it bureaucism. It's bureaucratic cynicism, this idea that, well, yeah, I'm all for that, but it'll never get through red tape. Well, it turns out if you lock all these people in a room and you feed them a lot of carbs, it will. You'll go cut right through it. <laughs> and then we paired up with two very important uh, local agencies, uh, the Building Community Workshop, which is uh, run by Brent Brown, who's an architect, very smart guy, and the Central Dallas CDC. And the Central Dallas CDC said, why don't you get something designed for this block and then we'll build it. So January last year, we launched a competition called Urban Revision Dallas. And we said, design something for the city block. And what we want is something that we've never seen before. So if you're gonna do basic ground floor retail with condos above, no thanks. What we want is something where you grow your own food, you collect, uh, generate all your own power and clean your own wastewater. However you do that is up to you. And then there's lots of other specifics, which I won't get into. It's a 30 to $60 million project. The site is about two and a half acres. And we had very specific requirements on density and all that other stuff. And we didn't just want a lead building. We wanted a living building, you know, much more like Cascadia's Living Building Challenge. So that's what we asked for. Uh, in last May, we had a, comp a you know, jury a competition, assembled a bunch of brilliant people and me uh, to kind of get together and and look through these uh, hundreds of entries from 14 different countries that came in, which surprised me more than anybody. And from this, we picked three winners. And I'm just going to show you quickly the three winners. You can go online and see the others if you want. Uh, this one is, um, is from a uh, little in North Carolina. It's called Entangled Bank. It's a very clever curtain wall that um, grows its own food on one side and generates power on the other. The massing is completely opposite of what you'd expect here in California because the sun is so intense in Texas, they, they kind of have to shade, the building needs to shade itself all the time. And then woven within it like a spiral is this green urban courtyard that winds up through the whole thing and adds acres and acres of space within this small setting. And they had this whole plan for how the retail would work for micro retail and uh, support local, uh, local economies and communities and stuff. And this design was so well received that it was uh, shortlisted for the World Architecture Festival in Barcelona, which I then got to go to in uh, last November. So that's kind of nice. Uh, this one is called Forwarding Dallas. This is from a group in Portugal, in Lisbon. And this idea is kind of building as a ruin, but the whole building is covered with food. It's uh, almost like a gingerbread house, an edible landscape. And it's uh, easily phased and easily buildable and very clever, and it creates a great quality of light on the inside. And then the ground plane was almost just as interesting, too, with these kind of cool community corridors and things that they had mapped out. They even picked what type of food they would grow on the building, which was quite clever. And the, this is the last entry, the uh, Greenway Zero Energy one uh, from uh, David Baker in San Francisco. 
And as kind of funky as the building is, I think this entry finally won because of the ground, the ground plane more than anything, which I, says a lot about the jury. I mean, after all, how many competitions do you see with chickens in it, right? <laughs> like any competition, the entries were, the winners were cool, but the, uh, the other entries were probably even more cool. Uh, these got honorable mention. They didn't win, but they, they were kind of noted. Uh, this one was uh, quite clever. Um, it's really a, a giant vertical farm all the way on the inside, similar to something you'd see in Southeast Asia. This one was clever. It incorporated vertical wind turbines all throughout it. Uh, this was from a student of Bruce Goff. Uh, it was a giant organism that was quite clever. I love this one. Uh, this one used uh, discarded shipping containers in this framework so the building could grow over time as you need. These used uh, prefabricated trays, which is quite clever. This one had a plant list that showed what plants would grow at what season and how they would complement each other, so how the strawberries would help the corn and all, so forth. This was this cool framework that would just keep growing over time. This was, a, uh, this was a kinetic building that opened and closed and moved, which I was sure would kill somebody, but the judges liked it. <laughs> uh, this one had a very clever facade solution. And then this one I love. This was taking old discarded airplane fuselages and clipping off the ends and then creating apartments in the tubes and sliding them in, which is pretty ballsy. And then uh, this one is creating the whole thing as a, a, a giant wetland, kind of reclaiming the whole site for nature. And then this one went even further and just said, well, screw it. Let's just rip up all the asphalt and concrete. And, um, so I like that. And then we had entries that didn't even have a building. They were theoretical statements about something. And uh, so those were cool, too. So this was the process that I just walked you through uh, very quickly. But you kind of get the idea. So we had those three winners. And of that, um, we sent them off to the developer, CDC and said, uh, well, you can pick which one you want. And they did their due diligence, and, and they did. And the best part is that we haven't even broken ground yet. I haven't even put a spade in the ground yet. And the mayor's already said, we're going to make this whole thing a green empowerment zone. And other developers are already now eyeing these other parcels that they once ignored. So imagine what it'll be like when our winner gets built by the developer. So that's pretty exciting. Urban Revision went on to do other things. This is um, City of San Francisco master plan for the Civic Center. Again, lock people in a room with a lot of carbs for two days and then ask them lots of questions about it. The process goes like this. We have uh, brainstorming with lots of post-its and then visualizing ideas. And we refine those ideas. And then we present them all to the actual department heads. They get to present them to their bosses. And um, we convert sketches like this into sketches like this that turn into sketches like this that eventually will become sketches like this. We then take all the information we get and we put it into a book and make that available to everybody so they can see the entire process. So here's the San Francisco book. And you kind of get the idea. OK. What about our final D? Despotism. Do you guys remember uh, sixth grade civics class? Despotism, it's, it's the you know, exercise of tyranny, you know, some tyrannical ruler. And most of you, when you think of despotism, you probably think of it on the political spectrum, the opposite of democracy, really. And, and, and it is. And when you think of despotism, you probably think of these kind of vicious, vile dictator types, like Kim Jong-il there. That's the best picture I could find of him. <laughs> but the type of despotism I'm talking about is, I think, even more sinister. This is uh, economic despotism. And by definition, again, it's the opposite of democracy. It's when you go from a balanced economy to one that's slanted where all the wealth is held by, I don't know, 1% of the population. And this is really embodied in places like Dubai, which is the poster child for economic despotism. All that wealth, all that opulence, and no taste at all whatsoever. And they kind of build all this stuff. And what's interesting is I was reading about how this poster child for greed had this problem. There were 3,000 cars that were abandoned at the airport. And they couldn't figure out why. And, uh, and I mean abandoned, like the keys in the ignition, maxed out credit cards in the glove compartment, a little apology notes on the windows saying sorry, and they couldn't figure out why. Well, it turns out the reason why all these cars are abandoned is because it's against the law, under Sharia law, to uh, have debt, to write bad debt. So fearing death and prosecution and jail time, they just left. They just dumped everything and got on a plane and left, and left their, all their cars there, which I think is quite telling, because uh, you go to jail for these types of things there. But is this really any different than, let's say, what Enron did, right? With their bilking of, you know, bilking of everything, and they're just walking away. And what's funny is, in the lobby of the Enron building, they had this uh, engraved in granite, 
There are four key words, integrity, communication, respect, and excellence. Integ really? Integrity? So just because you carve it in granite, doesn't, well, that doesn't really mean anything. And now we're seeing kind of a little more uh, sinister plot with the banks that too big to fail and you know, bailing them out with large masses amounts of money. But as an architect, I can tell you, they might have this bailout, but they're not lending any money to anybody. None of my clients can get funding for anything. So oftentimes you think maybe this is the plan that we had for saving the economy. Save, you know, save the banks, but who cares about while well, the rest of Rome burns? Well, you know what? This idea of too big to fail is a little sinister because I'll tell you something else that's too big to fail. Nature. Nature's too big to fail. We really can't do without nature. Imagine how you'd survive without fresh air and fresh water and you know, food and things. So we need to start thinking in those terms, and we need to change our priorities a little bit, especially because we treated nature pretty badly over the last 200 years. Our own little endless source of amusement and materials that we just keep taking and taking and taking, and somehow it'll you know, replant itself, I guess. I don't know. Somebody will look into that. And if you needed a toothpick, you just chop down a tree, and that's, that's all you really need. It also doesn't help when um, this economic despotism creeps even further into the media, where 85% of the papers are controlled by five corporations that are in, more interested in entertainment, really, than anything else. And that's part of the problem. So people don't get the news that they need. They don't get the information they need to make the proper decisions. And this furthers this economic despotism. And then, of course, in Congress, we have lobbyists, which really put the kind of feather on the cap of this economic despotism, because they're there championing their needs and don't really care about anything else. And lobbyists have doubled in number and in spending over the last 10 years. And that's part of the problem. I read this article about Exxon and how Exxon sent uh, $29 million last year lobbying Congress. And why would they do this? And then I heard the CEO, Rex Tillerson, said, you know, we're not an, ener we're not an uh, energy company, we're an oil company. Like, he made a point, like, to say, we're not interested in solar. There's no money in solar. And I, how can there not be money in solar, I thought. And then I saw that they spent $29 million, and I realized why. Because they get $113 billion back in direct federal subsidies. That's quite a good investment. And that's the problem. But it's not just the oil companies that are getting into this lobbying. Clean tech is getting into lobbying, finally, right? <laughs> In the first six months of last year, just the first six months, all of clean tech together is about 12.1 million. It's the most the clean tech has ever spent. Solar, wind, all combined, 12.1 million. That's great. It's a five-fold increase just from a few years ago. But if you look at just ExxonMobil, just one company spent 14.9. So Exxon, just alone, spent more in lobbying than all of clean tech combined. And if you add up all of oil and all of coal together, it's about 82.2 billion in lobbying. It's truly a David and Goliath situation. Oil and coal is spending seven times more than all of clean tech combined. And that's the problem. There are four <laughs> lobbyists for every single member of Congress. And that's just climate lobbyists, not to mention, of course, Small Business Association, the Lawyer Association, Healthcare, all that. Just for climate, just energy and climate stuff, four to one. So they're out number two. A few months ago, they had the vote for the Waxman, Mark, uh, Waxman Markley bill on, on cap and trade and carbon emissions. And I was really interested in the results of that. So I started to kind of play around and I said, well, let me look at a map. Here's a map of all the coal deposits in the US. I don't know if you can see them there. Kind of lightly painted in there. And we know kind of where the coal is. And then I looked at another map. These are all the senators that voted against cap and trade. And Democrat and Republican didn't seem to matter. And that was the part that puzzled me. I thought, well, maybe it's a partisan issue. It's not. Blue, red doesn't seem to matter. They just vote. And I couldn't figure out the pattern here until I laid the first map on the second map. And I started to notice a pattern. No wonder they voted against controlling carbon. Their state produces carbon. So suddenly it's not about Democrat or Republican. We've all been duped into thinking that it's some sort of color war. In truth, it's about money. And if you look at the cost of electricity in these states, we pay the most here in California, of course. And again, if you overlay where the coal is, you can see that the coal companies subsidize the cost of electricity. So that way they can keep doing business as usual. And again, another pattern. And yet, whenever I talk about this to other people, they say, well, clean coal, clean coal is the answer. Clean coal, clean coal doesn't exist. They don't even have a prototype. I mean, if they had at least a working model of it, it'd be something, clean coal is a myth, it's just all made up. 
It's something that can distract us another 30 years before we start to do something about it. This is um, Senator James Inhofe, very handsome man. And uh, he's a um, ranking member of the Senate Committee on the Environment, pretty important position. If you look at his campaign contributions, which are all a matter of public record, $660,000 he's collected just since the year 2000 from oil and gas companies for his campaign. This is also the senator that said the famous line, global warming is the worst hoax ever perpetrated on humanity. The worst. Worse than the moon landing. Like, I don't know. <laughs> even on his website, even, even has a little, little like, spot on his website where you can go and read all about the you know, disproving global warming and how it's all fake. But if you look at his voting record, which is also a matter of public record, you can see that 100% of the time he's voted in favor of his oil and gas companies. And why shouldn't he? I mean, that's who's paying the bills. So I want you to do me a favor. Here's his phone number. I want you to call him and tell him what a good job he's doing for the American people. Go ahead, write it down. It's fine. This is uh, Dr. Joseph Rom. He's fellow of the Center of American Progress. He says that we Americans suffer from what he calls anti-science syndrome, or ASS, as he calls it for short. <laughs> and this ASS this is creeping further and further, and it's affecting kind of all parts of reality. And this ASS just is everywhere. And uh, by the way, you should check out his blog at climateprogress.org. It's some of the best thinking about climate, uh, climate solutions, and you can actually read the science. Now, the trouble is that we've had ASS for a while. After all, we used to think that California was an island until science disproved it. That's what science does. It's science. It's not opinion. It's science. That's why they call it science. Science is not debatable. It's science. If I have an opinion, you can debate that, but this is, I, that's what I don't get. And that's the trouble. But science is being debated by people who suffer greatly from ASS. <laughs> Look at these guys. Mitch McConnell from Kentucky, big coal-producing state. Peer-reviewed evidence has shown that the sun is driving temperature change. You know, because the sun is hot. <laughs> Michael Steele, head of the RNC. Uh, the supposed warming is actually part of the cooling process. Greenland, which is now covered in ice, was called Greenland for a reason, right? No. No, that's not at all right. John Boner from Ohio. Uh, a carbon tax will increase taxes on any American who turns on a light switch. This is actually not true. It's been proven otherwise. And then my favorite, John Shimkus from Illinois. Only God decides when the earth will end. Really? You know, we used to have real leaders, leaders that looked out for the best interest of Americans, people that cared about people, great fantastic leaders like Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa Bono, people that really got us and looked out for us, selfless, altruistic people. And these people have been replaced by, I don't know, perverts and pedophiles, apparently. I don't even quite get it. Uh, we have Mark Sanford and, you know, the worst of all, this guy, what a disappointment, right? And that's the trouble. We need new leadership. Now, last year we had an election. And what a great election it was, right? The most people ever voted in that election, 129 million votes cast in the biggest election in history. But we had another election that year that was a little bigger. <laughs> Maybe this is how guys like this end up getting elected. I don't know. <laughs> so. Who are we going to get? Who are we going to get to be this new leadership? Who's going to rise up and help us and actually look out for people, for humanity? You. You. That's what we're going to get. We're going to get you. We need you to get up and do it, damn it. Because that's what we need. All of us need to step up and become leaders in our own way. And if you think it's intimidating, if you think it's overwhelming, you have all these tools at your disposal, things that can help you broadcast your ideas to millions. You have your own media network. You have access to everybody. It doesn't take any money at all now. Then there are sites like Creative Citizen and it's used the power of crowdsourcing to culminate hundreds of thousands of people together to move in a certain direction. And this is what we need. I lost a dear friend this last year. Poor little Michael Jackson. And this is how I like to remember Michael, the cute Michael, the you know, ABC singing with his brothers Michael, not the ghoulish, freakish Michael at the end. Kind of scary. And you have to remember that Michael, in his own head, I think did this for us. I think in his, he thinks he did this because this is what he wanted us uh, to do, him to do. 
So Michael really at the end became a bit of a tragic figure, right? Uh, once great, so much talent, so much promise, so much achievement, but in the end just kind of came sad and pathetic and resting on his laurels and could be great again, could really be great again, but now has just kind of lost his way. And I was taken by how much media coverage it got and continues to get. We're so obsessed with Michael Jackson and his death and what happened in his life. And then it dawned on me. Michael Jackson is America. He's the embodiment of America. Once great, with so much great talent and power and achievement, all these great things that we did, and we could be great again, but we kind of lost our way. Now bear with me. Michael Jackson was delusional, fragile, childish. He was in debt, he was on drugs, he was indulgent. He had a terrible diet, he was obsessed with his looks, and he was over the hill. This is what America has become. We were once so great with so much promise and so much potential, and we could be great again, but we've just kind of lost our way. Now bear with me. After all, we are delusional. <laughs> we are fragile. We are childish. And unfortunately, we're in debt. And yes, some of us are even on drugs. <laughs> we are overindulgent. And we have a terrible diet. These, by the way, are not as good as they look. <laughs> we are obsessed with our looks, and we are very much over the hill. No wonder we're so obsessed with Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson is America. America's Michael Jackson. He's the embodiment of what we are. No wonder we keep looking at him. Last year during the whole election thing, Mitt Romney was asked on a panel, he said, uh, what would you change about America? And he said, nothing. And I thought, really? Homelessness and crime and poverty, and that, that's fine the way it is, you wouldn't change that? And then I saw the title of his book, No Apology, <laughs> The Case for American Greatness. And I thought, this is the kind of hubris and arrogance that got us into this mess. After all, we're the only country that goes around saying, hey, we're number one. All the other countries are like, whatever. <laughs> Can you imagine? There's no other country that goes around and says, we're number one. If there was a guy like this in your neighborhood, hey, yo, I'm number one. <laughs> you'd hate this guy. <laughs> if there was a guy like this in your office, you'd hate him too. <laughs> you'd take his office supplies and put him in jail or do something. <laughs> That's the trouble. So I made a list. And I said, well, let's, what are we number one in? I didn't even know. So I made a list of things that I thought we should be number one. In fact, I assumed we were number one in things like life expectancy. I kind of naively assumed. <laughs> well, it turns out we're 38th after Cuba. Infant mortality, that seems pretty important. We're 46th after Guam. Healthcare, that's certainly important. We're 37th, we just beat out Slovenia. Number of doctors. We're 52nd, again, just barely beating out Slovenia. Solar power, we invented solar power. Surely we're number one in solar power, right? Psh, we're not even number one in solar power. We're sixth. South Korea is about to beat us. What about gross domestic product? That's our big thing, right? We're the richest, most powerful, whatever. We're eighth. Ireland is still riding high in a second tech boom that we missed out on. What about employment? We're 10th, beat out by Canada. Iceland is number one, by the way. Minimum wage, this seems pretty important. What we pay our young people? We're 13th after Switzerland. In Denmark, 10.92 an hour is their minimum wage. US federal minimum wage is 7.25, and of course here in California it's more, I know. But we do everything on our own. Educational spending, 37th, we tied with Estonia. Mathematical literacy, that's pretty important. We're 18th after Czech Republic. So then I thought, okay, beer. Surely we're number one in beer, right? We have to be. We're not even number one in beer. We're 13th after Spain. But you know what we are number one in? We're number one in handgun deaths. We're number one in total crime. We're number one in number of prisoners. Two million Americans in jail. China, which is six times our size, only has 1.5 million. We're number one in executions. We're the only free country that still performs executions. We're number one in rape. We beat out South Africa in number of rapes. How's that possible? We're number one in teen pregnancy. Uh, half a million a year 
uh, Poland, which is number two, only has 30,000. We're number one in healthcare expenses. We're number one in personal spending. And we're number one with population living below 50% of the median income. In other words, the greatest disparity between rich people and poor people. We're number one in plastic surgery. And we're number one in motor vehicle deaths, probably because we're looking at ourselves in the mirror. We're number one in external debt. We're 4.5% of the population, and we've got 25% of all the debt. We're number one in military spending, twice the entire European Union combined, $636 billion a year. We're number one in garbage production. We're number one in total energy use. We're number one in energy consumption. We're number one in oil consumption, 21 million barrels of oil a day. We're number one in oil imports. And we're number one in carbon emissions. Congratulations. Oh yeah, there's one more thing we're number one in. Obesity. So I thought, hey, I'm kind of fat. Maybe this is something I can do something about. <laughs> Let's start to look at the numbers, right? Well, it turns out 34% of us are obese. That's a body mass index between a certain number. Another, what's so funny? <laughs> Another 32% of us are overweight. That's a body mass index below a certain number which leaves the remaining third what I call, you know, skinny nerds. <laughs> All told, 72 million obese Americans, now although it's no laughing matter, but we're going to laugh a lot about it, but it's no laughing matter, 300,000 deaths a year, $117 million in healthcare costs, I mean it adds up, it's a big serious thing. And this healthcare obesity, this obesity trend is going to keep continuing, by 2030, 86% of us will be obese. And it just keeps going. And it turns out there's simple things that we can do. For instance, Driving in your car affects obesity. For every hour you drive in your car, it increases your likelihood of obesity by 6%. It doesn't mean you're 6% fatter, it just means that if you drive two hours, you're 12% more likely to be obese. And not just for these people, I mean anybody who's in a car, an hour, 6%. But it turns out there's simple things that we can do, like if you live in a walkable neighborhood with a high walk score, if you live in a walkable neighborhood, it decreases your overall risk of obesity by 35%. I thought Flabby's was perfect, by the way. So all this gave me an idea. And I want to run it by you. And it's not, <laughs> it's not for everybody. And the idea is a little controversial. And I call this idea glypodiesel. <laughs> I have a friend who calls it acetylene, but I think that's crude. <laughs> now watch, here just by the numbers. 72 million obese Americans. It would cost about five grand each to do liposuction on all of them. That's 360 trillion, it's a lot. For liposuction for all of them, it's a lot of money, granted. From each one, we'd get, on average, 50 pounds of fat, let's say. And that's average, I mean, obviously, there's some people we know we could get more. That's half a billion potential gallons of fat fuel. At 125,000 BTUs per gallon, that's 64 trillion BTUs produced. That's a lot of energy. You divide the first number by the last number, that's half a penny per BTU. It's the cheapest energy on the planet. We've solved the energy crisis once and for all. Imagine how happy all those fat people would be knowing they've saved 3.2 million tons of CO2 every single day. And they're thinner. And the best part is, it's a renewable resource, because we'll fatten up again. We'll get fat again. <laughs> Enough to power 800,000 homes for an entire year. If instead of heat energy, if you want to do the conversion to electrical energy, it's an easy math problem. 1.21 gigawatts of energy, which oddly enough is what Marty and Doc Brown needed to power the DeLorean, which is just a coincidence, really. What we need to do is we need to think more creatively. We need to find creative solutions to our problems. Because the old thinking that got us in this mess isn't going to cut it. We need to think like my idol, Willy Wonka, and find more creative outlets. So with that, I want to give you some homework. Five things I want you to try so you can be, you know, cool like me. First thing, I want you to do something. And I know a lot of you in this room, and I know you are doing something, but I mean something big. I'm going to get a lot of people together, and we're going to have a conference. We're going to have a contest. We're going to have this. We're going to start a competition. We're going to start an organization, whatever it is. And the best part is you're not alone. <laughs> Look around you. All these people are your fellow compatriots. Second, Arrange a talk with your school alma mater organization and have them bring me out and talk to them about this stuff. Because if you notice, I haven't talked about my work at all. I've only talked about other people's work. I'm trying to be self selfless here, which is hard for, you know, I'm a Leo, so it's hard for me. Third, if you're looking for ways to save the planet, 
the easiest thing to do is just follow the money. It's an old consulting trick that we used to do, right? First question I would ask at the first meeting, oh, you want to green up your facility? What are you spending money on? How much on electricity? How much on gas? How much on air conditioning? Those are the pain points for people. Those are the easiest places to start to make change. And therefore, they become the easiest savings. Fourth, change your perspective. Start to view all of these social issues as failures of design. They're design issues. Crime, homelessness, they're all failures of design in some way. And therefore, they can be redesigned and somehow questioned and re-questioned and fixed. And five, if all this seems <laughs> intimidating, and if it all seems overwhelming, and it is, just pick one thing. One thing and become expert at that one thing, whatever it is, whatever floats your boat, children's health, indoor air quality, solar panels, whatever, I don't care. We've got so many problems, pick one, and find out everything you can about that one thing. Find out ways to make that information more available to people, more accessible to people. Find ways to package it up and give it away to people. That's what we need. That's how we can be the change you wish to see in the world, because that's what we need. That being said, um, there's a bunch of organizations I want to tell you about real quickly uh, that I think you should get involved with. Architecture for Humanity, I mentioned briefly, they provide architectural services to people in need all over the world. Um, uh, the founder, Cameron Sinclair, wrote this book, Design Like You Give a Damn, which kind of says it all. There are local chapters here in LA and elsewhere, so uh, I encourage you to get involved. Green Home Guide is a free resource where you can list yourself as a green professional if you want, read reviews about green products, all free. Um, so. Might as well take advantage of it. Greenerbuildings.com, another free website with great articles and information and data. How You Eco is a kind of a social networking meets green site where you can go in and see what other friends, products they like and don't like, and you can rate and talk to different people. It's very kind of cool. Uh, West, Co West Coast Green, uh, I speak at 40 conferences a year. This is perhaps one of my favorites. Uh, it's up in San Francisco, so it's a good excuse to come north. Uh, this year, it's at the end of September. So I encourage you to check it out. And uh, lastly, the most important book you'll ever read. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but this past year, in addition to writing my two books, I, um, I had friends that wrote books. And these are four books that I encourage you to check out as well. Um, they're just very cool books. Design is the Problem by Nathan Shedroff, uh, The Truth About Green Business by Gil Friend, How to Build a Small Green Business, and 75 Green Businesses You Can Start. Get them in the library if you don't want to buy them. I don't care. But they're great books. OK. You can download this presentation from that address here. Otherwise, I encourage you all to come up and give me a business card, and I'll contact you back. Otherwise, thank you for coming. Thanks for not throwing anything, and have a good day.